Welcome to Module 3 of Sensation and Perception Online. This presentation will cover the visual pathway from eye to brain. We will also discuss how the visual world is mapped in the brain and how visual information is organized in the primary visual cortex. Let's begin tracing the visual pathway from the eye to the visual cortex. First, the ganglion cell axons form the optic nerve. These are the ganglion cells that are in the retina of the eye and their ax axons exit the optic disc. These axons extend to the optic chiasm. Here, the fibers of the optic nerve split. Looking at the lower figure, the large ovals at the top represent the area of the world seen by each eye. They are broken into quadrants. For the left field, red and blue refer to the left upper and left lower quadrant of the visual field. Yellow and green refer to the right upper and right lower quadrants of the visual field. Notice also how these quadrants are represented on the retina. Looking at the left eye, you can see that green is in the upper right corner. That is because the retinal image of the world is upside down and backwards. Next, axons from the nasal retina cross to the opposite side of the brain. You can see that the red and blue fibers of the left eye cross over to the right side and the purple and tan fibers of the right eye cross over to the left side. However, axons from the temporal retinas, the yellow and green of the left eye, and the magenta and brown of the right eye do not cross over. Notice what effect this has. Stimuli that appear in the right half of the visual world, represented by the yellow, green, purple, and tan areas, are seen by the left side of the brain, whereas stimuli that appear in the left half of the visual world, represented by the red, blue, magenta, and brown areas, are seen by the right side of the brain. After the optic chiasm, the reorganized collection of ganglion fibers is called the optic tract. The optic tract runs to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, or LGN for short. As we will see, every sensory system, except for smell, transmits to the thalamus. Here is where the ganglion axons, which, remember, began in the retina of the eye, finally terminate. They synapse on neurons of the LGN. Axons of the LGN neurons make up what is called the optic radiation. Notice that fibers in the optic radiation are still organized, are still organized, excuse me, the fibers of the optic radiation are still organized as they were after the optic chiasm. That is, the fibers of the left optic radiation correspond to the right, upper, and lower quadrants of each eye. The optic radiation extends from the LGN to the striate cortex, also known as V1 or the primary visual cortex. The lateral geniculate nucleus is where the ganglion axons of the retina terminate. There are two important characteristics of the LGN that need to be mentioned. First, the visual world is mapped onto the LGN in an orderly way. This is called topographical mapping. That is, adjacent neurons in the LGN correspond to adjacent areas in the visual field. By visual field, I mean what the eyes are looking at. Also, looking at the figure, assume that the eyes are fixated consistent with the dashed lines, that is, fixed on the point directly in the middle of the letters C and D. The left visual field, letters A, B, and C, are projected to the right hemisphere of each eye. The right visual field, letters D, E, and F, are projected to the left hemisphere of each eye. At the optic chiasm, the nasal fibers cross over so that the fibers that reach each LGN correspond to only half of the visual field. The left LGN corresponds to the right visual field, letters D, E, F, and the right LGN corresponds to the left visual field, 
Second, the LGN is structured in layers. The first two layers, layers one and two, are also called magnocellular layers. This is because they contain physically larger neurons, and magnus is Latin for large. These large neurons receive input from M ganglion cells, that is, the ganglion cells found in the periphery of vision that have large receptive fields. So the magnocellular layers of the LGN also have large receptive fields. This makes them respond primarily to large, fast-moving objects. The other four layers of the LGN, layers three through six, are called parvocellular layers. This is because they contain physically smaller neurons, and parvus is Latin for small. These small neurons receive input from P ganglion cells, that is, the ganglion cells found primarily in the fovea, and have small receptive fields. So the parvocellular layers of the LGN also have small receptive fields. This makes them respond to fine details of stationary objects. The axons of neurons in the LGN make up the optic radiation, which extends to the striate cortex, or primary visual cortex. It, too, has important characteristics. First, like the LGN, the striate cortex is topographically mapped to the visual field. That is, adjacent areas of the striate cortex respond to adjacent areas of the world that the eyes are viewing. Also, like the LGN, the right hemisphere responds to stimuli in the left visual field, and the left hemisphere responds to stimuli in the right visual field. Notice also that the figure shows that the eyes are fixated on the bridge of the woman's nose, directly between her eyes. This is point number five. Now, look at the striate cortex. Notice the point number five is located on the posterior striate cortex, so the very back, uh, whereas points one and nine, the periphery of the visual field, correspond to the medial, those center areas of the striate cortex. The second characteristic is that the amount of cortical area that corresponds to each region of the visual field differs. That is, the cortical map is distorted. The cortical area that responds to the center of vision, area five, is much larger than the cortical area devoted to the other areas. This is known as cortical magnification. The cortical area that responds to the fovea, the center of vision, is larger. More neurons are required for high detail visual processing. In fact, the area that corresponds to the fovea, area five, is larger than the areas that correspond to uh, the periphery of one through three, or nine through seven. In the late 1950s, Hubel and Wiesel set out to study the receptive fields of the striate cortex. This was seen by others, and even by themselves, as a potential waste of time. Remember, there are about a hundred billion neurons in the brain. Finding the one that responds to stimuli presented in a part of the world is like finding one needle in a million haystacks. Nevertheless, they set out to do it. They placed an, a microelectrode in the cortex of an anesthetized cat to record the activity of single striate neurons. They then presented stimuli on a screen in front of the cat's eyes and recorded the firing rate of the neurons. What they found is that neurons in the striate cortex respond to lines, or stripes, not to spots. The graph below shows the firing rate of a striate cortex neuron when lines are presented at varying orientations. Hubel and Wiesel found that striate neurons not only respond when a line is presented in their visual field, but that the amount of response depends on the line orientation. In the figure, the striate neuron recorded responds the most when the line is perfectly vertical, and not at all when the line is horizontal. 
In other words, the neurons were tuned to particular line orientations. This suggests that neurons in the striated cortex respond to the edges of objects, part of the process of object recognition. Additionally, some striated neurons responded maximally to lines of a particular orientation that were moving in a particular direction. Beginning with Hubel and Wiesel's work, researchers have continued to map out the organization of the striate cortex. What we now know is that the striate cortex is arranged in columns and layers. In the figure, each small colored square represents one column. Each column extends down through the cortical layers, layers one through six. All of the neurons in a column respond to stimuli in the same receptive field and of the same line orientation. All of the columns that respond to the same receptive field are referred to collectively as a hypercolumn. The complete set of columns in the figure represents one hypercolumn. All of the columns respond to stimuli presented in the same receptive field, that is the same area of the visual world, but the neurons in each column respond to different line orientations, that is the neurons of the yellow columns all respond to vertical lines but not to horizontal lines. The neurons in the blue columns respond to the same visual field as the yellow but only if the line in the visual field is a horizontal line. What this means is that each hypercolumn contains all of the neural equipment or machinery to see everything in the small part of the world that corresponds to their visual field. The striate cortex then is made up of a multitude of hypercolumns, each corresponding to the part of the world to which they are topographically mapped. To summarize, we have walked the visual pathway from the ganglion cell axons which make up the optic nerve over the optic chiasm to the LGN, then from the LGN along the optic radiation and to the striate cortex. Then we looked more closely at the LGN and found that it consists of layers. The magnocellular layers correspond to large visual fields and respond primarily to motion. The parvocellular layers correspond primarily to small visual fields in the center of vision and respond to the details of stationary objects. Lastly, we went over the striate cortex. We discussed that it is topographically mapped to the visual world and that the brain regions that correspond to the high detail processing of the center of vision are larger. They're magnified relative to the other layers other areas, excuse me. We learned that cortical neurons respond to stripes of a particular orientation and in some cases movement in a particular direction. Then we learned that the striate cortex consists of columns and hypercolumns in which neurons respond to specific stimuli presented in the same visual field.